Honey, we need to talk, Selma said to me as we drove the car home after taking our daughter Ashley to college. We'd be home in an hour in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, so we'd have plenty of time to talk. It's been an uncomfortable trip, though. Yes, I think we should, I replied. I knew what she was going to say. You still haven't fully forgiven me, even after eight years. I think we need to see a counselor again. We should be able to put this in the past and look forward to our future, growing old together, traveling, and spoiling future grandchildren. I've been thinking about this trip home. I've been thinking about it for the past eight years, shortly after that fateful day. The day I found out my wife was cheating on me. It was in the spring, eight years ago. I was running some errands for work when out of the corner of my eye I saw something bright yellow. I looked over and saw a brand new yellow Nissan Xterra in the parking lot of the Doubletree Hotel. We had just bought this car six months prior, so the yellow color caught my eye. Parked next to it was a slightly different shade of yellow Pontiac Aztec. Our friends, Jim and Sheila Henderson, had bought it a few months ago. Selma and Sheila must be having lunch at the hotel restaurant, I thought to myself. I'll just stop by and say hi. So I pulled into the parking lot and parked next to my wife and Sheila's cars. I walked into the restaurant and looked around. I didn't see them, but there was a table that looked like two people had just eaten there. They must have gone to the restroom, I thought. So I headed to the entrance of the hotel where the restrooms were located. I waited there for about five minutes. I must be waiting in the wrong place, I thought. They were probably leaving the hotel as I was coming in the other entrance, so I walked over to the entrance and looked out. Both cars were still parked there and there was no one around them. I turned around and saw my wife holding hands with Sheila's husband, Jim. Jim then leans over and gives her a passionate kiss. They then turn to the front desk and return the room key card. I was stunned, to say the least, but I wasn't paralyzed by inaction. I retorted to the couple standing at the counter. I turned Jim around and yelled, You fucking bastard! and punched him right in the nose. Almost immediately, blood rushed out. My wife gasped, and I turned to her and said, You bitch, you cheating whore! Don't come home tonight, I can't promise I won't do the same to you! I turned and ran out of the hotel. I took a quick step towards our cars. There were several dividers in the parking lot that were lined with trees and filled with palm-sized landscaping stones. I picked one up and threw it right through the windshield of Jim's car. The impact left a large dent and a web of cracks cascaded from it. I jumped into my car and drove out of the parking lot. I was so woozy that after a couple blocks I had to pull into the McDonald's parking lot to try to calm down. As I sat there trying to relax, my phone rang. I looked at the number. It was Selma. I screamed, bitch, and turned the phone off. Then I said incomprehensibly out loud to someone, I don't want to talk to you, bitch. How long has this been going on? I thought they definitely looked quite comfortable with each other. Besides, they didn't look like they were trying to sneak in unnoticed. Their willingness to kiss while standing at the front desk was eloquent enough to know that they had been fooling around for quite some time. I had to tell Sheila. She had to hear it from me before Jim or Selma tried to do something about it. I turned my phone back on. There were already three messages on there. I ignored them and called Sheila. She was a homebody and only worked part-time at the library while her kids went to school. I hoped she had today off or at least would be able to answer the phone. Lucky me, she answered. And how do I tell her that her husband is a cheating snake? I've always been somewhat of a straight shooter, so I did the straightforward thing. Oh, hey, Kurt. Then she asked, how can I help you? Ah! She was in her work mode, so the expression just came naturally. Sheila, I don't know how to tell you this, but I just caught Jim and Selma checking out of the hotel. They were very affectionate, so I have no doubt they were cheating on us. She awed and said, not again. Well, he just screwed himself to the wall. Wow, that wasn't the answer I was expecting. Hmm, I said in confusion. It's not the first time it's happened. In fact, to my knowledge, this is the third time. I had a post-nuptial agreement drawn up after the last one, and we both signed it. Any cheating by either of our parties meant that the cheater walks away with nothing and has to contribute to the household expenses and pay child support based on the percentage of income at the time. He would be paying the mortgage, child support, and spousal support. He screwed up. I knew it would happen again, but he begged me. He didn't want to be a part-time dad. 
Well, that's what he's going to be now. She was furious. However, I could tell she had been thinking about it, probably a lot since the first two times. When she mentioned the kids, it got me thinking. Our kids, Jason and Ashley, were the same age as Sheila and Jim's kids, Ethan and Emily. They were 12 and 10 years old, respectively. I knew I wanted a divorce, but I also knew I didn't want to be a part-time dad. Then Sheila asked, How are you, Kurt? Honestly, I'm kind of in a daze. I don't know what to think or what to do. I guess I'll have to talk to a lawyer, see what my options are. I hate to say this, Kurt, but Selma will probably get custody of the kids and the house. You'll be a part-time father. I know you love your kids. Maybe you and Selma can work things out. Hey, I don't know. I'm just so angry right now. I can't even imagine being in the same room with her. Believe me, I know I've been in that state. I can't say I'm numb to it, but having been through it twice, I'm not surprised and therefore not as emotional about it. But I'm going to throw him over the coals. When he gets home, he'll probably have a broken nose. I hit him pretty hard. There was a lot of blood, I told her. Serves him right, she said in a harsh tone. Then she said more gently, I'm sorry, Kurt. I'm sure he started it all. Maybe you can work it out. I don't know. I haven't had enough time to think about it. At this point, I need to start thinking about my kids and what's best for them. And Kurt, don't forget to take into consideration what's best for you. I appreciated her insight. She had a lot more time to think about it than I had, more time to look at it more objectively. Now, eight years later, I talked to a lawyer. The sad truth was that unless I could prove that Selma was an unfit mother or dangerous or abusive to our 10 and 12 year old children, she would likely get custody of our children. And I would be stuck in the role of part time father, all the while paying for the house and child support. We made about the same amount of money so there would be no spousal support. But it was a hollow victory if I couldn't be there for my kids. So I decided to get over it. I wouldn't divorce her. She said she was sorry and didn't want to divorce either. She was from a single parent family and didn't want to put our children through that ordeal. We went to counseling, it helped a little. I went to counseling, but other than giving my opinion, it was pointless. Three years later, we went to counseling again because our marriage wasn't what it used to be. Not a hell of a lot, of course not. I still had trust issues. Her job didn't help with that. I was a chemist at Pfizer and she was a sales rep, also at Pfizer. She was on the road most of the time and also attended conventions. In my opinion, she had every opportunity to deceive me. How did I know she wasn't? Obviously, our marriage was never the same. I had decided in advance that the day we took Ashley to college, I would start divorce proceedings. Now, eight years after that fateful day, we were driving home after dropping off our daughter. Today was the day. Today was the day I had to make a phone call to talk to my lawyer. She said, Honey, we need to talk. She had no idea that I had decided we needed to talk eight years ago. Now that the kids were gone, there was no reason to continue this deception. I thought about that day many times. Selma, I said, I'm filing for divorce. And I looked at Selma. She was still good looking, but the age lines were beginning to show that she was 45. Kurt, she said hesitantly, I'm filing for divorce. What the fuck? I thought, she's stealing my thunder. I should be the first one to drop the bomb on her. Now she's telling me she's filing for divorce? I regrouped. Act cool, I said to myself. Okay, I said out loud, unemotional. There was disappointment written all over her face. I don't think she expected this reaction from me. At least I surprised her in some way. What? Did she think I would beg her, that we could work it out? That I would try harder, go to counseling more often? That after more than 20 years of marriage, I wouldn't want to give up? She looked at me. She could see by the look on my face that I felt the same way. That this marriage had died eight years ago. It just hasn't been declared dead yet. Then she said, I've been offered a sales manager position at Bristol Meyer Squibb in Atlanta. I will be moving there in about six weeks. So she's been planning that for a while, too. I probably could have seen this coming. The last eight years have not been perfect by any means. It took me almost nine months to get to the point where I could have sex with her. And that's what it was. Sex. 
the emotional love connection we once shared was all but gone. I know it was all because of me, but she was the cause of it. The woman I loved unconditionally broke my trust. How could she do this to our family? She did this to our family. It wasn't just done to me. It forever changed the way our family would look at life and relationships. On that fateful night, Selma never came home. I never asked her where she was staying or with whom. I have to believe that unless she was feeling extremely guilty, she was staying at the Doubletree Hotel. Why not? The room was already paid for. I know from talking to Sheila that Jim came home acting as if nothing had happened. He said he tripped going up the stairs and hit his nose on one of the steps. He also had two black eyes from the impact. She said to him, grab your shit and get the hell out. He tried to deny everything, saying, nothing happened. Sheila knew better. When he tried to fight the post-nuptial agreement, I told Sheila to subpoena Selma to testify that they had indeed had sex repeatedly. Selma tried to deny it too at first, but I told her that if she thought I was so stupid, we would divorce right away. She didn't want to do that to Ashley and Jason. She wanted them to grow up in a family with both parents. I told her, you either plead guilty in front of a judge or we have no chance of reconciliation. Jim was furious that Selma had turned her back on him, but I told him, a man admits his mistakes. Are you a man, Jim, or are you a piece of shit, you sneaky bastard? Needless to say, we haven't spoken to each other since. He actually moved to Des Moines, moving with his job. So, he wasn't even a part-time dad, he was an absentee dad. He hardly ever visited his kids. Our kids knew something was wrong, but they adjusted to the new normal. I wasn't physically or verbally abusive to their mother. I just didn't show her my love like I had done before. Kurt, if I thought we still had a chance, I would have stayed and tried to make it work. Now that the kids are gone, it's just you and me. And you don't love me the way you used to. That would be the right thing to do, Selma said. I understand, I said. It was true, but how could a husband love his wife like he used to if she didn't love him enough to reject another man's advances? Through the counseling and discussions we had afterward, I had a pretty good picture of what had happened. First of all, they were our friends, so spending time with them was natural. Getting to know them and building rapport with them was also natural. So when Jim came over to my place one day when I wasn't home, it wasn't a big deal to sit and talk. Then, as they were finishing their conversation, Jim asked Selma, Are you hungry? Would you like to join me at a nice steakhouse and saloon? It's a restaurant in the Doubletree Hotel. That's where I caught them. She agreed, and after half a dozen lunch meetings, because Selma's schedule was flexible, he finally talked her into getting a room. She told me it was a forbidden high. It was the first time, but once Pandora's box was opened, and I didn't notice her guilt that night, it was easier to justify the occasional afternoon delight. It never took anything away from you, she said. It was just harmless fun. Well, that harmless fun lasted about three months and they got away with it until I caught them. Even now, I don't think she realizes how much that betrayal hurt me, to love someone and openly trust them, only to have that trust tainted by some harmless fun that changes a person. That's probably why I never reaffirmed my commitment to our marriage. Why commit to someone who doesn't see a problem with their behavior? She probably decided that the only real one was the one who had a problem. As we drove down the highway, it was quiet. Then I said, at least our kids didn't grow up in a single parent family. Yeah, I'm glad about that, she said. Stability in adolescence is important, and they are better adjusted to life. I would do anything for my kids. Then my first thought was to divorce her and move on with my life. We could each find someone else we could commit to, someone to love and share everything with, someone we could trust. It all came back to trust. Our children saw that no matter what, they could be assured that when they were home each day, we would be there together. Stability in a sometimes unstable world, especially during the tumultuous years of puberty. I was glad I decided to endure for their sake. The Henderson children had been through some rebellious times. Since Sheila was a single mom and they had an absent father, they had a difficult time. I kept in touch with Sheila. We talked on the phone about once a month or so. Since Jim left, I told her that if she needed anything fixed at home, I would see if I could save her some money. 
If I couldn't, I would share with her my thoughts on whether to repair or replace. She seemed to value my opinion. I enjoyed seeing her children, too. Our children were the driving force behind our family's friendships. They were in the same grades, so even though they lived in a different neighborhood, there were many activities where we saw them. I wish we had never started seeing them socially. Then Selma and I wouldn't have been in this situation. However, was it because of Jim, or would it have been someone else? I would like to believe it was Jim, which would at least allow me to have a little faith in the woman I love. I say love, not loved, because I still love her, just not as much or as much as I used to. It's weird how you define or set parameters for that. There are so many types of love, probably as many as there are different relationships. However, unconditional love is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Does such a thing even exist? You could say that you love someone unconditionally, like your children. But if they started disrespecting you, or, heaven forbid, started physically or verbally abusing you and being actively negative towards you every time you interacted with them, would you still love them? What if they told you, we never want anything to do with you again and cut you out of their life? Would you still love them unconditionally? Thankfully, that's not something I have to agonize over. My relationship with my children is very strong. As if reading my thoughts, Selma said, I'm glad we have good children who love us. They have grown into fine adults and will be wonderful parents, and we will be grandparents someday. That's so true, I said. They really did. They showed respect for each of us and for those around us. They are well-adjusted, and I had no fears for their future. They would blend right into society, taking an active part in making our world a better place to live. As I mentioned earlier, Sheila's children have been through some rebellious times. However, now they seem to be coming around. I am praying for them. As I thought about praying for them, I began to think about my faith. I have never been a very religious person, but when Selma cheated on me, I began to pray to God. First I prayed for understanding, then I prayed to make the right decision. Since then I have been praying for strength to get through this. I know I should probably pray for the ability to forgive Selma, but I haven't seen any real repentance on Selma's part, so I couldn't make that leap, maybe someday. Maybe it will be easier to forgive her when we no longer have to see each other every day. People say, separation makes the heart more loving. Maybe separation will make the heart more reconciled. I asked Sheila how she felt about it. She still has a lot of resentment towards her ex because of the few times it happened. She told me, there are days when I don't think about him at all. That's probably the closest I've come to forgiveness. It doesn't get there, I know that. But fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times, I'm just stupid. I wasn't fooled three times, but I was fooled for three months. It makes a guy question his powers of observation. This is probably another reason I had a hard time trusting Selma after she cheated on me. If she did it again, what would I do? How was I supposed to know? That's why as I sit here, heading home, I'm contemplating how to trust not only Selma again, but any woman that might come along in the future. Once bitten, twice shy, so the saying goes. I know myself, and that expression will definitely be a part of my personality in the future. Just another piece of my baggage that I will probably carry with me for the rest of my life. No, we'll have to decide what to do with the house and everything in it, Selma said. They'll put me in a furnished apartment for six months until I get settled, so I won't need any furniture. Although I might need some when I get my own place. Some furniture. The whole house was filled with things she just had to have. She could take it all out, I don't care. It would just be a reminder of her after she was gone. I didn't want that. What I wanted was to forget her. If I could forget her, I could forget what she did. We never forget, do we? I thought to myself, she will always be there, somewhere in the back of my mind. You can have it all. I don't want any of it, I said rather sharply. It was the first real emotion I had expressed on the whole trip. You don't want any of it? She asked in a surprised tone. No. I'm starting over with a clean slate, a new canvas to paint a different picture, I told her. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the sadness on her face. Do you hate me that much? She asked. No, I still love you. I will always love you in some way, but this chapter of my life is almost over.
Time to start a new one, I declared. What about the kids? She asked. Oh, they will be there. In fact, they will be an important part of the new chapter, hopefully soon having children of their own. I intend to spoil my grandchildren through and through, I stated. It would be great to have grandchildren. I can't wait. First, though, they both need to finish college and find their true love, she said. True love, I thought to myself. Does such a thing exist? Do we have soulmates? I thought Selma was my true love and my soulmate for life. Turns out she'd only been that way for about 15 years. Maybe she never was. Perhaps it was all a pipe dream. All of it turned to smoke in a matter of seconds, eight years ago. We drove on in silence. After about 15 minutes, she said, I'm sorry. For what? I asked. For everything, she replied. For everything. How could anyone be sorry for everything? Did she regret that we had even met? Did she regret that we had started dating? Did she regret that we fell in love? Did she regret that we got married? What about the kids? Did she regret that we had them? Did she regret having an affair or that I caught her? Did she regret that I just didn't accept it and let things get back to normal? Or did she regret divorcing me? I certainly don't regret it. I just wish she hadn't gotten ahead of me in the stroke. She was quietly crying. Why was she crying? She's the one who made the decision to get a divorce. So did I, but she didn't know that. I think she was crying because I took it so nonchalantly, like I didn't care. I cared. I cared a lot. I cared a lot that I had spent eight years of my life waiting for my children to leave home. I cared a lot that I went wah-wah with a woman who couldn't stay faithful to me. I cared deeply that all my life plans were ruined because she had to have a little harmless fun. I let her cry. I didn't say anything. I drove on in silence. It was a soothing silence for me. She didn't know what else to say, and I didn't want to tell her anything else except maybe, I hope someday you realize what you gave up just so you could have harmless fun. We arrived home and went into the house. She stayed downstairs while I went up to the master bedroom and started moving my clothes into Ashley's bedroom. Ashley had pretty much taken all of her stuff so she could have it in her dorm room. This room would suffice until Selma moved out, and then I would go back to the master bedroom. We'd put the house on the market, but in today's market, we'd be lucky to sell it, God forbid, within six months. We took out a home equity loan last year before the real estate market crashed, so we'll be lucky to get what we owe on it. At least the kids' education was financed, at least for the next couple years. Selma was in the kitchen, and I suspect cooking dinner. I had almost finished moving all my stuff when she came upstairs. What are you doing? She asked suppressedly. She could see exactly what I was doing. I'm moving my stuff into Ashley's room, I said as if nothing had happened. She looked at me and then asked a stupid question. Why? I turned away to put the last of my socks in the dresser and just looked at her. You didn't have to do that, she stated. We could have spent the next six weeks in the same bed. That would be best, I said, without any emotion in my voice. Nothing would have to change she said, we could still act like a normal married couple. For the last eight years, we hadn't been a normal married couple. Sure, there were times when we laughed, had fun, did the things every married couple does. There were even good times during those years. There were times when I didn't even think about her betrayal, but whenever we started doing anything physical and sexual, the memories always came flooding back. Our lovemaking was good, but it was never great afterward. In the back of my mind, I was always holding back. I'm sure she felt it too. Selma, I said, you'll be gone in six weeks, but the truth is, you left me eight years ago. I know it was painful. I could see it in her face. If she had any doubts about her decision to divorce, they were gone now. She knew I had no reservations. It was the right decision for both of us. She hesitated, turned around, and then said, Dinner will be ready in about 15 minutes. The next six weeks were filled with packing. We talked to a realtor about selling the house. He said that in the current market, it could take up to six months or longer to sell. I would stay until the house sold. Breaking the news to the kids was something we did together. We went to each of their colleges and took each one to a nice restaurant. Jason took it the hardest. We all had wet eyes as we discussed divorce. It would be amicable. 
Although we still love each other, we are estranged, we told him. He would find out the truth a couple months later when he asked me why we were divorcing. I couldn't lie to him, so I told him everything. Ashley's reaction surprised us both. We sat down and started eating. She could tell something was wrong. We asked Jason not to tell her anything, but I'm sure he mentioned something that put her in this mood. Selma said, honey, we need to talk, she replied. Yes, I think we should. There wasn't much emotion in her voice. Honey, that's not easy to say, she hesitated, then said, your father and I are getting a divorce. After a second or so, she said, good, I had a flashback from eight years ago. My daughter was more like me than I realized. She handled the situation stoically, with absolutely no emotion. This attitude made Selma stutter as she tried to comfort Ashley. Ashley said, I understand, Mom. I'm not a little girl anymore. I can deal with this. I thought we shielded our children from our problems eight years ago. These comments of hers made me think that no matter how hard we tried to hide it, she knew. Perhaps she overheard our argument and kept it to herself all this time. I felt sorry for her. She shouldn't have had to worry at such a young age about the problems we were having. The rest of the meal passed in a somber mood. She really seemed to be okay with it all. We were the ones who had a hard time dealing with our daughter's reaction. The day came when Selma left for Atlanta. We hardly said anything at all. She said to me, I still love you, I told her. Hey, I wish you success in your work and in your life. Then she said, if you need anything, let me know. Selma, we will see each other at special family moments, graduations, weddings, and the birth of our grandchildren. Let's be cordial and pleasant to each other. Of course we will, Kurt, and we will both spoil the grandchildren as we always planned. I smiled and said, I know we will. She smiled at that too. It was a little surreal wandering around the empty house that night. She took pictures, trinkets, and a few pieces of furniture, as well as her clothes and jewelry. It made the house seem more empty than it actually was. However, to be fair, eight years ago, she had taken some things out of the house that made it seem emptier then, too. Weeks turned into months, and finally the divorce was finalized. No fanfare, just a letter in the mail saying I was now a single man. I didn't celebrate as much as I could. I felt like I had somehow failed. I didn't hear from Selma, but I'm sure she received the same notice. There was probably nothing special about it. I'm sure she had already moved on and started dating again. I, however, took my time. Ashley called me like that the following week. I think Selma must have called her. Ashley wanted to sit down and talk to me. I told her, sure, honey, can you come home this weekend? Then we can talk. Yes, daddy. I'll be home Friday night. As we sat down for our conversation, she said something to me that made me sad for my daughter. Dad, I knew something was wrong over eight years ago. I overheard you and mom arguing. I didn't realize it at the time. You accused her of cheating. Even before that, I knew cheating was wrong. I just couldn't understand why it was such a big deal. I didn't realize it until a few years later, you were screaming about your mom cheating on you with another man. I also heard that you wouldn't divorce for Jason and me. We discussed everything that had happened. She understood what I had done and why. She told me that she never told Jason. She knew Jason couldn't handle it. He idolized his mom. My daughter was an amazing person. She would have been a great mom. Three years later, I finally met the woman who completely changed my life. I was 48 years old and a little hesitant about whether to get involved with someone. I met a 40-year-old woman named Jackie. She was a divorced woman with two children, actually already grown, 18 and 20 years old, a girl and a boy, respectively. Six years ago, she decided not to wait for the kids to grow up and divorced her unfaithful husband. When we first started dating, having been set up on a blind date, we both still had trust issues. I didn't want to waste her time. So on the first date, I told her all about my past failure and told her, I have trust issues because of it. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and said she understood completely. We moved slowly trying to keep ourselves safe, but also trying to open up to each other little by little. After six months, we finally trusted each other enough to take our relationship to the next level. To say I was nervous would be an understatement. She was the first woman I had been with, besides my wife, 
in over 25 years. We clumsily made our way through it, laughing at the awkwardness of different situations from time to time. However, we finally found our rhythm and spent several enjoyable hours exploring each other's bodies and what each of us liked and disliked. Our relationship developed and her children, Aaron and Julie, seemed to accept me and even liked me. My kids got to know her and her kids, and they liked them too. Our kids even started going out to play together and seemed to get along. I couldn't have been happier. After two years of dating, we got married. It was a small ceremony, but it was a joyful one. Jackie and I spent a week in Hawaii enjoying the sights and each other. It is now 2022, and I am sitting here thinking about my life. Jackie and I just welcomed the birth of our third grandchild. Her son Aaron got married three years ago and had children almost immediately. Not to mention her daughter Julie got married 18 months ago and has already had a baby too. This got me thinking about my own children, Jason and Ashley. Jason had three serious relationships, but when women started pressuring him for commitment, he couldn't handle it. Each of them broke up with him, looking for someone she could spend the rest of her life with. Ashley had gotten married four years ago, but was adamant that she would not have children. Her husband didn't feel the need to change that. He liked their freedom. So, I am spoiling my grandchildren from my second marriage. I don't know if I will ever have grandchildren from my own children. After talking to Jason and Ashley, I'm a little doubtful about it. I don't see Ashley changing her mind, and I think Jason will remain a bachelor for life. Selma never remarried, opting instead to date, though, as her boyfriends get older and older as she goes on. She continues to pester Jason and Ashley about the grandchildren. I think she will continue to be frustrated, both with the expectation of grandchildren and her single life. I ran into Sheila last week. She told me that she has been a grandmother five times now. Her children have both been married and have led wonderful lives. It seems that after their tumultuous teenage years, they have settled down, gotten degrees, good jobs, and found their soulmates. Hearing this made me wonder, did I do the right thing by my children? Did eight years of marriage just for the kids cause irreparable damage to their psyche? Is that why one can't make a commitment and the other doesn't want to bring children into this world? I just don't know, but one thing keeps coming back to me. It's what Sheila said on that fateful day. I said, at this point, I need to start thinking about my children and what's best for them. She replied, And, Kurt, don't forget to take into consideration what's best for you. I wonder how my life and my children's lives would have changed if I had followed that advice.